Hey MSM, it's Miss Jen here and I've got a story for you today. I went to sleep with gum in my mouth and now there's gum in my hair and when I got out of bed this morning I tripped on the skateboard and by mistake I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running and I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At breakfast, Anthony found a Corvette Stingray car in his breakfast cereal box, and Nick found a junior undercover agent code ring in his breakfast cereal box. But in my breakfast cereal box, all I found was breakfast cereal. I think I'll move to Australia. In the carpool, Mrs. Gibson let Becky have a seat by the window. Audrey and Elliot got seats by the window, too. I said I was being scrunched. I said I was being smushed. I said if I don't get a seat by the window, I'm going to be car sick. No one even answered. I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At school, Mrs. Dickens liked Paul's picture of the sailboat better than my picture of the invisible castle. At singing time, she said I sang too loud. At counting time, she said I left out 16. Who needs 16? I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I could tell because Paul said I wasn't his best friend anymore. He said that Philip Parker was his best friend and Anthony Moya was his second best friend and that I was only his third best friend. I hope you sit on a tack, I said to Paul. I hope the next time you get a double-decker strawberry ice cream cone, the ice cream cart falls off the cone and lands in Australia. There were two cupcakes in Philip Parker's lunch bag and Albert got a Hershey bar with almonds and Paul's mother gave him a piece of jelly roll that had little coconut sprinkles on top. Guess whose mother forgot to put in dessert? The cat wants to sleep with Anthony, not with me. It has been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. My mom said some days are like that, even in Australia. I think we can all agree that life can be disappointing and frustrating sometimes, but I'd like to see if that's true. Now, I have some social distance friends here with me, and they're gonna make noise like this. If they have ever experienced any of these things, have never experienced disappointment, have never experienced things going badly, have never been rejected, have never lost something valuable or precious to them, have never experienced sadness, have never lost out to someone else, have always had all their prayers answered the way they wanted. Clearly, everyone here has experienced disappointment and rejection or unanswered prayers at some point. But here's one more question. Let's hear that sound if you've ever heard or thought that following Jesus would make everything in your life okay. Thanks. There's a verse in the Bible, it's Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that tells us that in everything God works for our good. Some people interpret that verse to mean, if I follow Jesus, everything's going to be all right. But we know from our own experience that this isn't true. Even when we follow Jesus, we don't get everything we want. We still get hurt. Bad things still happen to us. So why does that matter to God and why does that matter to us? So think about a time that you really hoped something would happen, but it didn't. Have you ever asked God to do something, but God didn't do what you asked? How did that feel? Do you believe God answers prayers? If so, how do you think prayer works? If not, what would it take for you to believe God answers prayers? So you guys are gonna take some time to look at a man whose life is pretty much an extended version of Alexander's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. So I want you to grab your Bible and I want you to open it to the book of Job and start with chapter one, verses one through five. Now what I want you to do is pause the video and read those verses. So what kind of person 
and does scripture tell us Job is? Take some time to think about that. Next, pause the video and read Job chapter 1, verse 6, through Job chapter 2, verse 10. So what just happened to Job and how did Job react? Now, your next one's a big part. I want you to read through and summarize in your head Job chapter 3. Don't forget to pause your video. Job cried out to God and asked, why? Why is this happening? He'd done his best to follow God and couldn't understand why God was allowing him to suffer. Now, this is where you're going to have to take a really good chunk of time. I want you to go through and summarize and read through Job chapter 4 all the way to chapter 37 and really pay attention to Job's three friends and what happens. who tried to comfort him through all of his pain. But after sitting with Job for a week, they decided they had to answer Job's question about all of this and what was happening to him. Except their answers were pretty bad, offensive and hurtful actually. Here's what they told Job. This is your fault. Bad things don't happen to innocent people, so you must be guilty of something. Your kids deserved it too. God has a plan. You just have to wait and see what it is. Um, you know, that's not comfort or comforting or helpful when you're grieving the loss of literally your entire family. Be thankful. God must be disciplining you for something. Be grateful it's not worse. You know, that's pretty terrible, but don't we hear things like this all the time? Maybe we've even actually said it to somebody else. These friends of Job go on lecturing him for a really long time. And when they're done, Job finally tells them, hey, everything you said is super hurtful and really offensive. And guess what? You're wrong. Job says he hasn't sinned against God, but even if he had, nothing that he'd done would deserve the suffering that he's experiencing. Job cries out in pain, asking God to just end his suffering already because it's too much. So pause your video and take some time to summarize Job chapters 38 through 41. Finally, God responds. God appears and speaks to Job out of a great whirlwind. And what do you think God's going to say? After all of that and everything, God didn't even answer Job's question. Job wanted to know why so many terrible things had happened to him. God answered, but not in the way that Job expected. Job asked, why? And God said, I'm the creator of everything. I'm bigger, greater, 
more powerful and kinder than you could ever imagine. You are so small compared to me. Job didn't get the answer he was looking for, but he did get an encounter with the creator of the universe, and that was enough for him. So if you're dissatisfied with how this story ends, I get it. I used to feel that way too. To be honest, I still do sometimes. When horrible things happen, I still want God to tell me why they're happening. You know, it's hard to have faith when you're experiencing something difficult that you can't understand or that you can't explain. And that's okay. That's the point of Job's story. So just like I said two weeks ago, you're not alone in your questions. Job had a lot of questions for God too. And like we said last week, God doesn't shame us for our questions. God never condemned Job for asking why because God understands our pain. Now, in Job's story, we learn a third important thing about our questions and about our doubts. Our questions don't always get answered. Let's talk about this. As we do, I want you to think and be sensitive and be kind about what you're thinking about yourself and what you're thinking about others, knowing that these are difficult subjects for a lot of us. And please try to be honest with yourself and don't feel pressured to share. Think about, have you ever asked God a question that never got answered? Think about what you asked. Have you ever asked God for something that you didn't receive? What was it? Have other people tried to comfort you during a tragedy? How did they comfort you? And was it actually comforting? Do you think God has ever spoken to you like God spoke to Job? You know, minus the whirlwind. Think about it. At the end of Job's story, God restores Job's life by giving him double of everything that he had before. But that doesn't take away the pain or the suffering that Job experienced. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the passage we mentioned earlier, okay? The one that people sometimes think means everything will work out fine. Okay? It's Romans 8. It's verse 28. We know that in all things God works for good for those who love him. Those whom he has called according to his purpose. This verse doesn't mean our lives will eventually have a happy ending. You know, it's not the end of a sitcom. It's not our favorite Disney movie. When we experience pain and heartache, the hard truth is that our questions don't always get answered. But God can redeem our suffering and what we've lost. Everybody say the word redeem with me. And we're going to repeat it three times. Redeem, redeem, redeem. What do you think it means? To redeem something is to reclaim, repurpose, restore, or regain it. Like Job, sometimes we lose a lot, but redemption means that our stories don't end there. And before we close together today, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to be together today, even if we aren't in the same physical space. Thank you for allowing us to experience pain and heartache, knowing that it can be followed by your comfort and your redemption. Help us to be calm and steadfast in the weeks ahead and remind us that our stories are always unfolding. Keep our families and our friends safe. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you guys so much for being here with me today. I look forward to meeting up with you again soon. Have a great day.